The calendar tells me that this is the last Sunday of 2020. So I'd like to end this year with a sermon that I hope will magnify God in your eyes and, um, and glorify Him. I have one verse in mind from Isaiah chapter 25. Isaiah 25. The verse that I have in mind is the very first verse of the chapter. Isaiah says in a prayer, O Lord, You are my God. I will exalt You. I will give thanks to Your name. For You have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. O oh Lord, You are my God. What I want to say here in passing at the very beginning is I want to highlight this idea of Lordship. He says, O oh Lord. There are those who have in their philosophy of religion an idea that you can have Christ as Savior and not acknowledge Him as Lord. I've never thought that. I announce that as a heresy. If you'll have heaven, you'll have it on God's terms. And it's not Christ as Savior only, but Christ as Lord. The word Lord in this context means a ruling Lord, one of supreme authority. There are those who cynically classify my belief as Lordship salvation. They say the way that I believe is a way of works. They say salvation is by faith alone and Lordship is apart from that. They say you can have Christ as Savior and believe in Him and not make Him Lord of your life. That's the Gospel they preach. I don't hold that. I agree with Paul in Galatians 6, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. Will any man make it to heaven who won't bow the knee to the Lord here on earth? He won't. I can't imagine one in glory walking the streets of glory who is there by claim that Christ is his Savior, but who would not bow the knee to him and serve him while he was here and alive on earth? That seems to be a mockery to me of God and salvation. The message of the apostles was this, 2 Corinthians 4.5, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord. Not Christ Jesus as Savior alone. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was poured out, said, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made Him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus who you crucified. He's Lord. God made Him that. When the Gospel, the celebrated Gospel, was preached to the Gentiles first in Acts chapter 10, Peter took the Gospel to Cornelius. And he said to that group there gathered in Cornelius' home that he was preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That's what we hold here. That's what I hold here. Paul told the Romans, to this end, Christ died and lived again, that He might be Savior only? No, that He might be Lord, 
both of the dead and of the living. He's, he is Lord. Even Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I say? To the Philippians, Paul said, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. He said, those who are in heaven, those who are on the earth, and those who are under the earth, those who have already died, in other words. And every tongue will confess, what? That He is Lord. Christ Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It was said of the Lord Jesus when He was walking the earth, they marveled that even the wicked spirits obeyed Him. They obeyed Him. Why? Because He's Lord. So what man would stand in a high-handed way and say, I'll have Him as Savior, but I won't have Him as Lord? Paul told the Corinthian church, there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, just as there's one God and one Father. So here the Isaiah, he acknowledges the Lord as Lord in his prayer. And then he speaks of God. He says, you are my God. God the Father. God the Creator, the All-Powerful One, life-giving, life-sustaining, all-knowing God. God. Now, God is God whether He's your God or not. Just like Jesus is Lord, whether you acknowledge Him in that capacity or not. But Isaiah says, you are my God the personal aspect. Can you say that today? Yes. Can you say that God is your God? There is a big difference. It's one thing to acknowledge God as God, but to say that He's your God. Can you say that this morning? You remember Thomas when the Lord Jesus appeared to the twelve after the resurrection displaying the wounds in his hand and his side, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Can you say that today? So Isaiah opens with this prayer at the start, O Lord, you are my God. And then he says, I will exalt you. Now my resources tell me that this word exalt means to raise and elevate in esteem. I will exalt you. I will raise you and elevate you in estimation. In praising God, we exalt Him. In preaching Christ, we exalt Him. In acknowledging the works of the Holy Spirit, we exalt Him. And it's not that we can make Him any higher than He already is, but we can make Him appear to ourselves higher than we understand Him to be on any given moment. And that's what we need. We need to have God and the Lord Jesus Christ exalted before us. We need to have a bigger view of Him, who He is, what He's accomplished. Why is so little said? Why sometimes so few prayers or praises or songs, or exultations, maybe we need a bigger view of our God. Isaiah has a determination here, a desire, a resolve. He says, I will exalt you. And then he says, I will give thanks to your name. And gratitude, it comes naturally to those who have a sense of their privilege. When you have a, a grand view of God and a sense of what you, you are privileged to know and experience in Him, it produces naturally gratitude. I will give thanks to your name. Not only resolve to exalt you, elevate you in esteem, but I'll give thanks to your name. 
And so I say we need to have a sense of the magnitude of what's been accomplished for us and in us. And on our behalf, Lord, save us from ingratitude and for taking for granted the goodness of the Lord and presumption and all of those kinds of things for overlooking myriads and multitudes of kindnesses and, and for being silent when, when even, as it were, in the days when the Lord Jesus triumphantly entered into Jerusalem, the Pharisees standing by were uh, reprimanding Him to call down your disciples for making such a, such a noise. And He said, if these were silent, even the rocks would speak out. Lord, save us for being silent when we need to. We've experienced so much at His hand that we need to open our mouths in praise and exultation. So, this prayer Isaiah opens with an acknowledgement of the Lordship and the Godship of God, personal aspect of Him being His God and a resolve to exalt Him, and a resolve to give thanks to His name. And then He gives a reason here. And I want to spend the rest of the sermon here looking at this reason. He says, for, that's a reason, because. He might as well have said, because. I will exalt you, I'll give thanks to your name, because you've worked wonders. Moses said in Exodus 15, Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, and working wonders? God is a wonder-working God. And He's worthy of every exaltation. We exalt God by admiring His works. They're truly wonderful. They're supernatural in the midst of nature. And I'm ashamed at how easily I lose the wonder of it all. And don't give God the the exaltation and the glory He deserves. His wonders, I want to speak just for a moment on the characteristics of His wonders, the essence of them. His wonders are unrivaled. They're novel. The psalm writer said, what God is like our God? You are the God who works wonders. He works wonders, genuine ones, real ones, not fake ones, not illusions. He naturally works that which is outside the realm of nature. It's supernatural. And He's working wonders today. His wonders are ongoing. It's not just that we read about them having happened 2,000 years or more ago in the Bible accounts. God is working wonders today. And His wonders are novel. He's unrivaled. The psalm writer in 136 verse 4 said to him who alone does great wonders. So he does wonders. He, the wonders that he does are great ones according to this verse and he alone is the one who does them. His wonders are many, not a few. Many, O Lord, are the wonders which You have done and Your thoughts toward us. There's none to compare with You. If I would declare and speak of them, they'd be too numerous to count. Job says, Who does great and unsearchable things, wonders without number? That's a lot of wonders. So His wonders are unrivaled. His wonders are many. His wonders are great. Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. In a little while, we might study a little bit of these wonders of the Lord. 
that great throng that's in heaven gathered there right now, they're singing about the wonders of God. They sang the song of Moses, the song of the Lamb. It's called, Great and Marvelous Are Your Works, O Lord God. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. So his wonders, let's look at them for a moment here. In Job 37 and verse 5, Elihu was one of the counselors of Job, and he got it right at this point. He said, God thunders with his voice wondrously, doing great things which we cannot comprehend. They're over our head, they're beyond our understanding, but it doesn't keep us from marveling at them and from exalting Him in the midst of them. Why do we have to understand something to praise God for it? He went on to give Job this advice, and it's advice for us today too. Hear this, O Job, stop and consider the wondrous works of God. So he does wonders. Wonders in the natural realm. Wonders the human body. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Might have a lot of things going wrong with me because of sin in the world. Old age or whatever the case might be, but still you cannot escape the fact that you're wonderfully made. There are so many systems in operation in our body one could wonder why we don't fail in all of them. You know, there are those that um, choose to believe that somehow we came into being um, as, a, as a result of something other than the power of God, spoken Word of God. Of course, I don't hold that and Neither does anybody else that's here, so far as I know. But that um, idea of evolution would state that you and I are here as a result of infinite time coupled with chance. That's why we're here. If I thought that was why we were here and that's why the world was the way that it is and things happening the way they are, wouldn't it make you want to get off the train? I think that's why the suicide rate is so high as it is. People can't bear the thought that all of this is just random. What's the purpose to it? This idea of infinite time and chance. There's a little book here. It's called Know Why You Believe, written by Paul Little. I want to just um, relate a few things that he said in here. He quotes a British astrophysicist, a man that died in 2001. His name was Sir Fred Hoyle. And he spoke critically of this idea of infinite time and infinite chance. And he's the one that coined the phrase, the Big Bang Theory. Even though he spoke against it. That's what he called it, and it, it took hold. Well, this man, Sir Fred Hoyle, he came up with a couple of analogies that are impacting, to say the least. And in regard to this idea of infinite time and chance being the way in which we all arrived here at this spot. And he said this, he likened it to a blind man working a Rubik's Cube. You know a Rubik's Cube? That square that has all those colors, little small colors, and you spin it all these different directions to solve the, the puzzle. Can you imagine doing that blind? Well, since Sir Fred Hoyle was not only an astrophysicist, but a mathematician, he figured out that if this blind man could make one move every second on this Rubik's Cube, 
and solve it by chance alone, it would take 1.37 trillion years for him to do that. And he said, since the average lifespan of a man is not that, it would be virtually impossible by chance to solve a Rubik's Cube if you were blind. He went on to say, one chain of amino acids in one cell of the human body contains 200,000 amino acids, one chain. He said, for that to happen as a product of infinite time and chance, the odds would be worse than this man solving a Rubik's Cube blindfold with a blindfold, blind. <laughs> One chain of amino acids. You see, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. So over and against this idea of infinite time and chance is, is specific intentional design. That's the God that I want to exalt. This Sir Fred Hoyle also gave the illustration. It's a little more down home. He said if a tornado went through a junkyard in which there were all these parts for jets, and as a result of that tornado passing through the junkyard, a complete and functional 747 was sitting there on the tarmac, that's more likely to happen. <laughs> so this is the God we exalt. We look out into outer space, telescopic, out into the cosmos. We see things that are, that cause us to marvel. The psalm writer said, I consider your heavens the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've ordained. What is man that you're mindful of him? We look in, not just out into outer space. We look in at things that we can only see that are microscopic, not telescopic. Can't see them with the human eye. Miniature worlds that exist. Microscopic organisms. Don and Cindy Kern gave me a plant last summer. It's a hibiscus plant. I, I, it's the only one I brought inside. Well, it's the only flowering plant I brought inside for the winter to save it. It was so beautiful. Big pink, bright pink blooms. Well, right now it's got spider mites. If some of you might know what those are. I cannot get rid of those things. You know, you can't see them unless you have a magnifying lens. They're so hard to see. And it caused me at this point to, to say there's an illustration. Here is, here's an entire species that moves and eats and reproduces. Boy, do they reproduce. And they eat. They're eating my plant alive, and I can't get rid of them. You can't, you see, my point is there are, there are worlds in existence that we can't even see <laughs> the hand of God. And those spider mites, they've got some kind of exoskeleton or whatever and muscles that move. Can you imagine a spider mite muscle? <laughs> How small is that? miniature worlds as well as the ones in far outer space. Did you know that thousands have climbed Mount Everest? Thousands of people have climbed Mount Everest. If I asked you how many people walked on the moon, you probably most of you wouldn't know. I, I didn't know, I had to look it up. 12 people have walked on the moon. Do you know how many people have gone to the deepest part of the ocean. There's only been three people make it to the deepest part of the ocean. 
It's called Challenger Deep. It's 6.85 miles deep. You could actually take Mount Everest, submerge it in Challenger Deep, and have 7,000 feet of water over the top of it. That's how deep it is. It's three times the depth of where the Titanic is discovered in the northern Atlantic Sea. They tell me that if you take a 16-pound cannonball and drop it over the side of a boat at the Challenger Deep, it'll take 75 minutes before it finally reaches the bottom. Well, three men have made it down there. They went down in a vessel that had five inch thick steel walls to withstand the pressure. So many tons of pressure per square inch. They went down, down, down into the depths, the deepest part of the ocean. And you know what they found down there? All these little delicate fish swimming around. <laughs> creatures, delicate sea creatures that could live in the total darkness near freezing water temperature, living and teeming down there. That's God. You have done, you have worked wonders. We need a bigger idea of what God is. Wonders of nature, wonders of providence. Job said whether for correction or for his world or for loving kindness, he causes it to happen. Providence. God controls all the nations of the earth. That's a wonder that he does that. A living example is the case of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, who in the days of Hezekiah the king, Sennacherib conquered all these nations destroyed them, decided that he was going to besiege Jerusalem, starve it out and conquer Jerusalem. And he sent that, that um, captain of his army, Rabshakeh, to make the announcement to Hezekiah, this is what I'm going to do. You might as well give it up now. I'm just improvising and giving you my paraphrase. But he said, all of these other nations couldn't stand before me. And he lists them, and all of their gods were unable to deliver them. So why should you believe that your God is going to deliver you? And Isaiah took that, that letter that he received from Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and he spread it out before the Lord in the temple and prayed. And the Lord sent Isaiah the prophet to Hezekiah with these words of the Lord, and the Lord was addressing the king of Assyria. The Lord said this. He said, Have you not heard? Long ago I did it. From ancient times I planned it. Now I've brought it to pass that you, the king of Assyria, should turn fortified cities into ruinous heaps. Therefore, their inhabitants were short of strength. They were dismayed and put to shame. God did it. He was putting this king in his place and saying, don't be so proud here. I'm the one that ordained it a long time ago that you'd ruin all of these places and conquer all of these cities. But he got to Jerusalem and it wasn't so there. God intervened and delivered Hezekiah because he prayed. Moses said in the Song of Moses, chapter 32 of Deuteronomy, remember the days of old and consider the years of all generations. Ask your father and he will inform you, your elders and they will tell you, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance. And when He separated the sons of man, He set the boundaries of the peoples. He sets the boundaries. And Paul, when he was preaching there at Athens, 
Speaking of God, he said, he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. And not only that, he determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. That's providence, and that's a wonderful work, a wondrous work. God controls the appointed times, the boundaries of their habitation. Psalm 139, your, your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. It's all in the providence of God. Not even one. So think of it, your place in the timeline of history, <clears throat> providentially God is appointed. Your location right here in small Midwestern town, God appointed that. Your lifespan, how long you live, God's got that figured out. You were born here in America in this day and age and not over in some dung heap in Bangladesh. You were born in a country with religious freedom. The very fact that you're sitting here looking at me and listening to what I have to say, God ordained that. <laughs> and hearing the things that you're hearing today. Job says his days are determined and the number of his months is with you and you've appointed his limits and he cannot pass. My times are in your hand. We preached a sermon on that very idea. We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. God prepared them beforehand that we should walk in them. It's providence. That's a wonder working ability of God to manage the whole world and to manage your life and the details of it. So we've got the wonders of nature, the wonders of providence. What about the wonders of grace? The psalm writer says he's made his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He lists two of the wonders of God right there. His grace and His compassion. Think where we'd be if He was the opposite of that. Unkind and cruel. An all-powerful God who was unkind and cruel. Instead, He's not. He's an all-powerful God full of grace and compassion. That's a wonder, the wonder of His grace. In Psalm 107, there are four crisis situations there in the form of parables that are listed. And they have corresponding deliverances and all with the same appropriate concluding response. And um, the very first one speaks of, the, of people who are wandering in the wilderness in a desert region in verse 4. In verse 5, they're hungry and thirsty and their soul fainted within them. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble and He delivered them out of their distresses. That's grace. Then the common appropriate concluding response is this, let them give thanks to the Lord for His loving kindness and for His wonders to the sons of men. So if you're here today and this describes you, you're wandering in a wilderness and your soul is hungry and thirsty and fainting, this is the solution. Cry out to the Lord and He'll deliver you and it's a wonder that He is gracious and compassionate. It goes on to say, he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul. He's filled with what is good. Uh, 
Then there's another situation, crisis situation there of those that are in bondage and He delivered them when they cried out in their distress. It says, let them give thanks to the Lord for His loving kindness, for His wonders to the sons of men. For He has shattered gates of bronze and cut bars of iron asunder. Then there's another situation there. He saved them out of their distresses. He sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. The same appropriate response. Give thanks to the Lord and His wonders to the sons of men. There were those it speaks of there in verse 27 of that chapter. They reeled and staggered like a drunken man. They were at their wit's end. You ever felt like you're at your wit's end? (laughs) He caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea were hushed and they were glad because they were quiet. And He guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His loving kindness and for His wonders to the sons of men. Wonders, wonders, wonders. Four different times. Wonders of grace and deliverance in the middle of these difficult, distressing circumstances. And the greatest wonder is perhaps that He performed all of these as a benefit to unworthy creatures. It's a wonder. So the wonders of nature and of providence are topped by the wonders of grace. The others are all in the natural realm. But here's the wonders of grace that are eternal. Then he says lastly in in Isaiah 25, our text, you formed plans long ago. The Lord is the eternal first cause of, of everything. It's all according to His plan. And it's all been formed in the mind of God from ancient times. Plans formed long ago. I'm okay with that. I don't know. Some people, they don't like that idea. They don't like to think. They call it fatalism or something. They like to think that they're in control of their own destiny. I'm okay with a God of this magnitude running my life. It's all right with me. And when things happen around me that I can't explain, and in my eye, my estimation, they appear to be negatives. They appear to be the worst case scenario that I could think of. It's okay with me to bow the knee to a God like this who is wonder-working in areas of providence and plan-forming from long ago. That's all right with me. In fact, I say that's where, you, that's where the peace is at. He says, Jeremiah the prophet says, for I know the plans that I have for you. God declared that in Jeremiah's account. Plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. You know, that's on a lot of plaques hanging on people's walls and things like that. Um, Because it's very comforting uh, thought. But the idea is God has plans for you. It's very personal for me. Plans formed long ago. Well, is there any plan greater than the plan of redemption? But it was from the beginning. All the way back in the garden. The seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. That was a very little glimpse right there of what was coming in history. You fast forward all the way to Acts 2 when Peter stood up at Pentecost empowered by the Holy Spirit and full of boldness. And he said, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. It was according to God's plan. It was all predetermined. And when that group was gathered there in Acts 4 to pray, 
regard to persecution. In verse 27, part of their prayer was, Truly in this city that are were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Not to do whatever they wanted to do. His purpose. Plans formed long ago. Paul told the Ephesians, we've obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will. Again, there are some who have problems with this. This idea of predestination and the foreknowledge of God in all of it. Personally, I don't. It's okay with me. (laughs) Plans executed, he says, formed long ago and executed with perfect faithfulness. Has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Has he said and will he not do it? It's the Father of lights. There's no variation or shadow of turning with him. Joshua said to the people when he sent them away for their inheritance after having conquered the land of Canaan, he said, not one of the good promises which the Lord has made to the house of Israel failed. They all came to pass. You fast forward to the day of Solomon praying and dedication of the temple, the new temple. He said, blessed be the Lord who has given rest to His people Israel according to all that He has promised, and not one word has failed of all His good promises, which He promised through Moses His servant. Three times He uses the word promise there. Points out not one word has failed. Again, in that place glory where the saints and the angels are gathered right now in worship, John in his vision said, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true. So faithful is he who calls you, he'll bring it to pass. Plans formed in perfect faithfulness. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So I say, as I did at the beginning, we need a bigger view of God. (laughs) This year comes to an end and we're starting a new year. That's what I that's what I want to see here is you and I, our hearts, to be lifted to exalt God in thanksgiving to Him because we have a bigger view of Him. And of we're somehow able to grasp better the wonders that He's that He has worked in nature, in providence, in grace and rejoice in it, in His plans that have been executed in perfect faithfulness. And to trust Him, whatever this year holds, and the years to come. The future can be very intimidating and fearful. But if we have a bigger view of God, we have more comfort in the midst of those times and are better able to weather them. So, amen. We serve a wonder-working God. Let's exalt Him and rest in Him.